Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're here, and I'm uh, really excited I got to do one of the first sessions because, like, by day two, my voice is so hoarse, you wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. So, okay. Welcome to uh, How to Build Beautiful Forms in Drupal 7. And just to kind of clarify what this is about, we're tackling some of the dynamic parts of the form API. This is kind of a coding-based thing. We're not looking at CSS, really, or any ways to kind of prettify the form, but really actually making a form usable by dynamically changing it as it gets filled out. Okay. No one's getting up and leaving, so good. <laughs> so um, just in case you guys want to take a moment to write these down, um, a couple of resources. I do a site called buildamodule.com. Um, can I see a raise of hands from anybody who's watched videos on there? Okay, just a few. Um, <clears throat> I uh, have an hour and a half section on the form API, so if you want to review kind of what we talk about today later, uh, you can follow this link and watch those for free. And then uh, if you want to download the source code, we're going to be moving kind of fast, so it'll be a little difficult to follow along with the source code today. But if you want to, as you go through this later, you can download it at this uh, <laughs> second link here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one argument for not putting music on the site. Um, and then if you want to give feedback afterwards, there's a link down here at the bottom, and I'll go ahead and show this page at the very end. Um, just real quick as you guys are writing this down, I wanted to uh, share a little anecdote about context. So on the site, on, on the Build a Module site, when people watch a video, there's a little form afterwards that says, hey, do you have anything you, know, you want to share about this? Like, did you like it? Did you not like it? Or whatever. And a lot of people, you know, write just simple, like, good or not so good or whatever, you know, really simple things. And every once in a while, I get something that uh, just sort of strikes me. And uh, the other day, I got one that just made me laugh out loud. It said, my girlfriend learned absolutely nothing from this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking about, okay, what's the context here? <laughs> Is someone getting forced to watch these like tutorial videos on coding? She's like, oh yeah, let's hang out and watch something. Okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so like that was the wrong context for her. And uh, so I want to make sure you guys are in the right context. I don't want you guys to be the girlfriend in this case. Um, so let me get a sense real quick of how many people in here have built a simple module or feel like you could probably if you needed to. Okay. And how many people have kind of touched the form API in some way, altered a form, built a form, something like that? Okay, so probably about a third. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm accounting for maybe 20% of people whose arms aren't, like, awake yet. Um, <clears throat> so what we're doing here is we're actually leaping, kind of uh, fast-forwarding a bit through learning the form API, through um, some of the quicker aspects of... Or, or some of the basic aspects of building forms. So I'm assuming that, uh, and it's okay if you haven't yet, but I'm assuming as we start here that you've built a form, you know how to embed it on a page, you've uh, worked with validation functions with forms and submission functions. So if you haven't done this, and a lot of you haven't, that's okay. Uh, you'll just have to kind of infer from what we do, sort of <laughs> what's going on there. And you can always rewind later uh, to watch the videos or you know, review the documentation on D.O uh, about the form API um, as, you know, afterwards to kind of regroup. So what we will be covering is the state attribute, which allows us to toggle certain sections of a form on and off. This is new in Drupal 7. Uh, we'll look at how to use hook form alter. We'll use hook form alter to add an autocomplete. And then we'll uh, use the AJAX in order to dynamically add new inputs to a form. So state and AJAX are kind of similar, and you'll see that, but they have some important differences. So just to be clear, this is Drupal yes. 7. This is Drupal 7 stuff. Yes. OK. Um, so if you have any questions, if you like get um, sort of stuck or whatever, um, you can either wait until the next section. We'll kind of you know, sort of start, start again. Um, or you can, you know, raise your hand, just let me know. I'll try to bring you back up to speed. I guess we should probably close these doors. Thank you. Okay. So, I'm, uh, let me refresh this, and my full screen was a little different size earlier. 
So I have a, a vanilla Drupal 7 site. I've just installed it, no contributed modules or anything. I've downloaded that resource pack that you saw the link to, and this includes a folder called input. And um, yeah, my mouse is, yeah, yeah. let's bring that back. <laughs> okay, there we go. So um, the folder is called input, and this is actually a module, a demonstration module. And so what I've done is moved it over to my sites all modules folder, which is where you put contributed modules. Inside of the folder is a steps folder, and this contains snapshots of the code as we go through it. Now, um, like I said, I'm kind of assuming we've gone through building a simple, mod, uh, simple form, adding a submission function and a validation function, and looking at some of the attributes of uh, the form API, some of the attributes of elements and different types of elements. If that sounds strange to you, no problem. Um, <clears throat> but this is kind of where we're starting off. And so we've built a couple of examples in the source code, and we're going from here. Okay. So I'm opening up one of these states, or one of these snapshots, uh, for the state attribute. It's number six, if you follow along later. And I'm just going to copy the code, and I'm going to paste it over the code that's in the input.module file, which is empty right now. So this is, again, the code that you downloaded. So this is so I don't have to type out the code as you guys are, are watching. So I'm going to jump to the browser, and in order to, whenever you install a module, uh, installing a module will usually clear your cache for you, but when you update a module, you need to clear the caches manually, and you can do so by going to configuration, and then going to performance, and then going to clear all caches. And what this will do is clear the menu registry, so if there's new pages that have been added with your module, it will add them so you can now visit those pages, and a couple other things too. So there will be a, another reason why we need to clear the cache later. I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page, and it will add this form API examples link in the navigation. I'm going to click it, and there's a more elements and attributes link here. <clears throat> and I'm going to click that. Okay, so this is the form that we're going to be working with. It's really simple. So just to demonstrate the state attribute and the Ajax attribute. And the idea here is that it's asking if you own a computer. And if you select yes, I'm going to go ahead and do that then it drops down this field set here with a couple additional inputs. So what's happening here, and if I click no, it will hide it. So what we're doing is we've added some elements to our form, and we're dynamically showing it and hiding it with the state attribute. Now, if you've used, uh, how many people here feel comfortable enough with jQuery or JavaScript that you would be able to do this in JavaScript? Wow, okay, cool. So, so you kind of know what's going on here. Let's go ahead and look at how you would do this in the form API. And um, just in case you're, you're not aware, the reason why it's good to do this in the form API is because it gets run through uh, several alter hooks, which allow other modules to adjust the form later. So if they wanted to show additional inputs when this yes got clicked, they could do that. If they wanted to change the behavior, they could do that too. OK, so um, I'm going to just start out here at the very top of the code. We have a hook menu function, which allows us to register pages. And we're on this input examples more page. We're using the callback for this page of Drupal get form, which will take a form render array and convert it into HTML. How many people here know what a render array is? OK. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever worked with PHP, you've, you've probably run into the pattern where you boil down a set of settings or configuration options and use that in order to kind of in loop through it in order to render some HTML or, or go through some output. So a render array is kind of those settings boiled down into a, a multi-level array inside of PHP. And you'll see what this looks like in just a second. The argument that we take here is the function that returns the render array for the form. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and search for this on the page. It's the input more form function. And this will just take, jump me to the place in the code where this uh, form array is. And inside of here, we're defining a form render array. We're starting out with this yes or no radio button that allows you to select the if you have a computer or not. This is pretty vanilla. And you can see we're just adding elements to the form array here. And then the field set is a special type of element here. 
you can see that the type here is field set, and we're giving it a name of computer stats. And here's where we're adding this states attribute. Now the states attribute, uh, it affects this element, but also any embedded elements too, any elements that are children of this element. So here we have the thickness element, which is part of the computer stats. It's inside of computer stats, you can see here in the uh, array structure. And so all of these will get shown or hidden. So here's the states attribute. <clears throat> and let me just read this in plain English. It says that this element will be visible if an input with the name of computer has a value of yes, which seems pretty straightforward. But let me take you through the, through the pieces here. First of all, um, if you've done this with jQuery or JavaScript, you probably uh, a little, you, you may be kind of flipped around because you would associate the action, you know, the yes or no click, you would associate the action with that input. You'd say, when this is clicked, then we're going to show this. But in the form API, it's switched around. You add the state to the element that's going to be affected rather than the element that's doing the affecting. So this states attribute is an array. And so it contains what could be a list of multiple states. In this case, we're just adding one state for visible, but we could also add a state for, vis for invisible as well. And then this next part is an array of conditions that need to be met in order to make this state occur. The first part of the condition is the jQuery selector for the element that's going to trigger, that we're going to check the value for, or that we're going to check the state of. So in this case, what we're doing is looking for an input that has a name, and that's the attribute of the input of computer. And we can always rely on this, because this, when we add an element to our form array, and we give it this key here, computer, that will be the name attribute in the form. So we can always use this name attribute in the code here. And so we're checking to see if this element has the value of yes. Okay. So let me just jump back, uh, and, and that's really it. It's just these you know, three lines, really. And once these three lines uh, are run inside of the form API, then that creates that ability to expand and contract that option, those options on the form. So on this page, yes or no, we're showing it and hiding it. OK, any questions so far? Yes? For that selector, could that be used have you used any other jQuery selector, or is that specifically has to use the input name? No, you can use any jQuery selector there. But input name is uh, one you can rely on, so you know. But if you know that an element on the page has a certain class, for example, or an ID, you could use that as the selector. Anything. Yeah. Oops. Yeah? So does that mean basically you could even uh, take, like, align it with something outside of the form? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. So like if you want like part of the form to display if somebody's, you know, if there's something that exists like in their profile or something and you want that just to show up automatically, you could do that. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Yes. This is not related, but is it possible to move that box right there, the wind one? Yes. <laughs> Anyone want to sit on this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay. So, um, so this is very similar to what we're going to do with the Ajax attribute, but the difference is that with the state attribute, all of these form elements are part of the form already, and we're just showing and hiding it. With Ajax, what we're doing is building new inputs into the form behind the scenes. Okay, but we'll get to that in just a sec. We're going to do a little segue here to explore the form uh, hook form alter. <clears throat> okay, so we have a form here for the search, this is the search form, just enabled by default in Drupal. And what we're going to do is <clears throat> take this input and convert it into an autocomplete that keeps track of people's search history. So I type in something, and it saves it to history. And the next time I start typing it in, it will drop down an option to allow me to like, pre-fill that input with my search history. So you know, kind of Google suggestion style, right? So I'm going to go back to the code. And again, we have this snapshots folder called steps inside of the, the module directory. And I'm going to open up the seventh step, which is called hook form alter. And again, this is just a snapshot that includes some additional code from the previous snapshot. 
and, um, and I'm going to go ahead and save it. Okay, so the only code that I've added here is this form alter function and then this input search submit function. So what we're doing is adding a new submission function to this form, on the, to the search form. And uh, the idea of submission functions is that they can stack one on top of another. So we have a certain amount of processing that's going to go on because of the existing submission functions for the search form, but we're going to tag on some additional stuff. We don't want to edit it or manipulate it in any way, we just want to tag on some stuff. So the way we're going to do that is by using a hook form alter function. It takes three parameters, the first which is the form, which is the form render array that gets returned from the function that we were just looking at, form state, which contains the values of the form once it's been submitted, so we can then access whatever content the user has filled in, and then the form ID, which is a unique ID for the form. Now, a hook form alter function will get called on every form on the page, so we need to target the specific form that we want to alter. And so we need <clears throat> to do that, we need to know the form ID. The way we can find that is by going to the browser, and um, in Firefox I'm using a plugin called Firebug, which most of you are probably familiar with, but you can also use um, other sort of development tools in any of the browsers. But what I'm going to do is right click on the element here and click inspect element and this will bring up the Firebug dialog. And this will highlight the input that for the search form. And what I'm going to do is actually move up, um, up the hierarchy. This is the source code for the page until I get to the form that contains this uh, input. And the ID here is the ID that we're looking for. The difference is that in, in the ID here that we need to convert the hyphens to underscores. So instead of search hyphen block hyphen form, it'll be search underscore block underscore form. And this is also the name of the function that gets called for the form render array for this form. So if you're looking around, this is how you'd find it. OK, back to the code. Question? Yes. The, the conversion of yeah. Is that a Drupal thing? And so, <clears throat> how often do you have to do that? Um, well, this is just, uh, you know, the only thing that we're doing is trying to find what our form ID is. We could do so by looking for the name of the function that creates that, that form, and that would work just fine. But if we're looking for something quick, we're just looking for the source code. So we don't have to do, the only thing we're doing here is just uh, aligning those, that difference, the hyphens, right, with the, the change that we need to make in the code. You'll see this sort of switch between, I'm sorry if that was confusing, you'll see this switch between hyphens and underscores quite a bit, um, but it's all um, conventional, so you know when that's happening. But um, this is, I think, the only point where we're going to see that in this, except it, it might happen with the, the form uh, input name as well. I don't know, did that help at all? Not really, but go Okay. <laughs> Can you uh, clarify just a little bit what your question was? You're you're stating that there's a convention to sometimes turn dashes and underscores. Right. And okay. I'm wondering when that applies. Okay. In this case, what's happening is that the form name, or the, the function name, is when it gets rendered into HTML behind the scenes, you don't have to worry about that, those, those underscores get converted to hyphens. I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> I think it has something to do with PHP guys, correct me, but functions can't Hyphens or functions can't, but I don't know why they're converting it to hyphens in the ID. Yeah, well, I think it's also because CSS can't use underscores. That's it can, can. Yeah. and IDs IDs typically contain underscores rather than hyphens, anyways. But um, it is confusing. yeah. <laughs> so I guess this is just a, a rule of thumb. It's a Drupal convention, right? Okay, that's the way I'm going to answer every question from now on. <laughs> It's a Drupal convention. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm using a switch statement here to, you know, add this logic only to this particular case, um, but you could use an if statement here too. We're checking for the ID, and we're saying uh, we're adding a submission function by adding it to the submit attribute. And when I say attribute, you know it's an attribute when there's this hashtag here in front of it. And we're just adding it to the end of the submit array. And so this is the function that we need to create in order to add our logic. So if we look down here, here's our function name. Uh, a submission function takes two parameters, form and form state. Again, these are the same as what was used in form alter. 
Our first step is getting the search phrase that's being used. And we're doing that by looking in the values array that's inside a form state. Now again, this is the, the form values that have been submitted. And we're looking for the search block form input. Now the way we get this name, if we jump back to the browser, uh, again, we have this input right here highlighted in the source code in Firebug down here. And if we look, if we scroll over a little bit uh, to where we see the name, we see search, in, and these are underscores, search underscore block underscore form. And so if you want to target a specific value without using a debugger or using devel or something like that, this is a quick way you can find it and target it in your code. I'm going to jump back to the code. Okay, so that's all we're doing uh, here, grabbing that search phrase. And then what we're going to do is use a simple mechanism for storing the search history and getting it back out using the Drupal variable table. And the two functions that we're going to use are variable get and variable set. They're pretty straightforward. The first part is pulling out the variable if it exists already, because we're, you know, this will happen several times, so we want to grab the search history first. And so we're getting it using variable get. If the variable doesn't exist already, we're going to set it as an empty array. Now this isn't necessarily form API specific, but this is just some code so you can kind of understand you know, this example a little further. We're going to add the search phrase that we just pulled out of the form to the end of the search history array. And then we're going to reset the variable, which now includes the new search history item. And then we're going to set a message that says your search phrase has been saved to history so someone knows we're spying on them. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like in the code. I'm going to close out Firebug and I'm going to clear the caches because when you add a form alter function or a submission function in this case, uh, you need to clear the caches. I'm going to refresh the page. Okay, and I'm going to do a search for test right here in the search box. When I do, we get this uh, message here that says your search phrase has been saved to history. And if we do this again, and just do another test, then we get that message again. Okay, so now we have two items in the search history. I actually have a few more because I've been running this test a few times. Um, so now the, step, the next step is to add the autocomplete to this input. So autocomplete is kind of fun, um, but there's a few steps involved. So I'm going to jump back to the code and I'm going to pull up the eighth step, which is called autocomplete in this snapshots folder. I'm going to copy the code and paste it over the module file. And I'm going to save it. Okay, I'm going to scroll up <coughs> to our form alter function. So this is where we ended from our previous step. We added the submission function. In this step, what we're doing is adding an autocomplete path to an existing element. So that text, text element that we saw, we want to add this autocomplete path attribute to. What this, the value of this is going to be a path, a Drupal path. So we'll need to create this. This is just kind of an arbitrary path, but we'll need to add this page. So this is, this is it in order to add uh, just that, uh, the little loader you see on autocompletes in Drupal. This is pretty much all you need right here. The next step though is to create this page, this input slash search autocomplete. So I'm going to scroll up to the top. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and there we go. And I've added the item in our hook menu function here, input slash search autocomplete. This is just a type of menu callback, so we don't register any menu items for this page. And the page callback is the name of the function that's going to get called that will basically return an array of matches for this autocomplete. So I'm just going to do a search for this function. So again, we're just naming this function whatever. Um, but I've already created it, so I'm going to jump to the code. And so here's our, this is what's needed in order to get an autocomplete to work. <clears throat> Basically what we're going to do is grab the search history, we're going to loop through the search history, and see if we can find the phrase that got searched for inside of each item. If there's a match, we're using just the str, istr, php function to, to match it. If there's a match, then we're going to add it to this matches array. And then the trick for, for this autocomplete is that we're going to use Drupal JSON output, which is just a Drupal function, that will take this array and kind of package it up, serialize it in a way that can be used um, on the JavaScript side. So JSON is short for JavaScript object notation, and it's just a, a JavaScript object. And then Drupal takes over from there. 
So this is pretty simple code, but you need these specific steps in order to do this. Um, one kind of interesting part right here is that the array that we pass to Drupal JSON output, the key here is the value that gets put into the text box when the drop-down element is clicked. And then the value here is what you see in that drop-down. So they don't have to be the same thing. So our drop-down is going to be very simple. It's just going to be some text. But um, we could have images in it, any HTML, rich text, whatever. So you can have previews in that drop-down. And when somebody clicks it, then it just inputs an ID or you know some plain text inside of the input. For now, we're just using the same, we're using phrase as both the key and the value here. OK, so I'm going to save it and jump back to the browser. I'm going to clear our caches again in order to register the new menu item <clears throat> for the autocomplete. And I'm going to refresh the page. Now you see this little circle here, which indicates this is an autocomplete. And if we start doing a search for test, then we'll see this drop down here. And we can select one, and it will pre-fill this input. OK. Any questions? Yes? So you literally don't have to write any client side autocomplete anything? Yeah, yeah, no JavaScript, right? It's all PHP. Isn't that cool? That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, Drupal is designing when to search that array, so with the pause and a character input. Right, and right, character. right. So, like you know, if we're if we start typing in here and I, I'm continually typing, it's not going to go and and do the search, you know, because that just wouldn't be performant, right? So it waits for a little bit of a pause, and then you see that little loading graphic. So yeah, that's kind of tricky to do if you've tried to do it in JavaScript. It's not fun, but but yeah, it takes care of all that. How many people feel like they're kind of on board and following along? How many people feel like they're not really and they're kind of lost? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, well, good. Uh, <laughs> if you're lost, it's important to know that you're lost, I think. So um, hopefully, hopefully you can catch up later. Uh, like I said, we're jumping kind of in the middle, and I think these these particular things that we're covering are, are tricky. They're like the trickiest parts of the form API because there's several steps involved. You're not just like turning something on. You're turning something on, building a menu item, returning it in a certain, some code in a certain way. So these are tricky and it took me a while to wrap my mind around it even after looking at good solid examples. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna look at is Ajax loading. So I'm gonna load up the code here. It's the ninth step and I'm going to uh, paste it over the module file that we've been working in, input.module. I'm going to save it. I'm going to go ahead and demo what this does before we go through the code. I'm going to clear all the caches first because we're adding a menu item. OK. I'm going to go back to our original form <clears throat> by going to Form, API Examples, More Elements and Attributes. I'm going to click Yes here. So this is what we've added, this operating system in this computer information form. And if I select an option here, Linux in this case, it adds this checkbox. It says, are you sure you're using? And then the name of the operating system. I don't know why you'd want to verify this, but you know, this <laughs> <laughs> it's a little contrived. Um, but the idea here is we're reacting based on the value of this. So this says Linux here. We chose Linux here. And if we chose something else, it would say that something else. So if you if you you know you if you work with JavaScript you know how to do this on the front end but this is all back end stuff this is this is the form being rebuilt in the back and using the values that are in the input so a good use case for this is that um, sometimes you don't know what elements should belong in a form at the beginning right like for example this is a form for a single computer but say if we wanted to add this button at the bottom that says add a new computer and somebody can keep adding a list of computers as they go. We don't know how many computers they have or how many they would want to register. So we need to, uh, and we don't want to just build like a hundred of these uh, elements in the back end and just show or hide them based on, you know, whatever criteria are being used. So we want to just dynamically add these new inputs to the form. Um, again, <coughs> Drupal works a little differently than if you're just working on the JavaScript side or jQuery side you know uh, probably that you can add inputs to a form on the front end. You can just say, you know, we click this, we'll just replicate this entire HTML and plug it in below. 
and you know to the user all, you know they just see this form expanding but to Drupal Drupal takes a snapshot of the form in the in the um, in 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 a cache and when the form gets submitted it checks this cache to make sure that the inputs that are being submitted are identical to the ones that are in the form. Like basically if there's any additional inputs that you've added with JavaScript, they're not going to be part of that form state array that we can use. You can get to it with post, you know, but, but using form state is nice. <clears throat> so, so with Drupal, we have to rebuild the form to include any new inputs that we're adding. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that actually looks like. I'm going to go back to the code. And I'm scrolling up to our uh, form render array called input more form, this function here. And what we've added is down here at the bottom. So here's our operating system input. It's a select box. For the options, we're using a function called Drupal Map Associ, which is kind of a nice little handy um, function that will take a flat array and make it associative. So you can use it with this options attribute. And then we're adding this Ajax attribute here. It takes two parameters, at least this example does, callback and wrapper. What's happening here is that <clears throat> when this input changes, this function is called right here. That function then returns a render array or HTML that then gets plugged into a wrapper with this ID. So an element, some HTML element, probably a div, with this ID. And so, uh, <clears throat> so this is the process that's going on. And, and then Drupal rebuilds its cache, the form API. The, form, the form's cache gets rebuilt. And so now we have some new inputs in our form. And the user hasn't had to refresh the page or anything. So, <clears throat> so we have a couple of things that we have to do here. One, we need to define this function. And second, we need to add this wrapper somewhere in our form in order for it to get filled in. So here's, here's the first part of it. We're adding our div with the ID of input OS verify wrapper here. This is the, we're just adding a new input of a markup type, which is just some HTML. This is called OS verify. And we're adding the div as a prefix and a suffix. So this is the opening and then the closing div. <clears throat> if you've used the form API before, you know that you could use a value here for the markup. But there's a reason why we're using prefix and, prefix and suffix instead of using the value attribute. And that is that when the form gets rebuilt, we're, re gonna, we're gonna repurpose this input and we're gonna make it a checkbox instead of markup. So this is kind of a cool thing about the form API is that you can actually dynamically change the element type. So this is just some HTML, but we're changing it here to be a checkbox. And we're adding a title to it that says, are you sure you're using, and then the operating system. So when this gets rebuilt, we'll be checking the form state to see if somebody has selected an operating system. If they have, then we're going to go ahead and change this input here to a checkbox. If they haven't, we'll just uh, leave it at what it is, which is that markup. But this prefix and suffix attribute will cascade into this because we've already set this form attribute, we've already set this form element, and these attributes are just cascading down to this OS verify element that we're adjusting here. What's happening is that Ajax replaces this this wrapper here it doesn't just add something inside of it but it actually replaces it so if we want this Ajax uh, interaction to work again we need to add this wrapper back as part of the as part of the form API as part of the Ajax callback now yeah okay yeah yeah okay and then um, <clears throat> so the last part here is to take this callback which again we need to return some HTML from and create it. The, the Ajax callback takes two parameters, form and form state, just like a lot of the other functions that we've seen here. And what we're doing is just returning the OS verify element inside of this form render array. Now this isn't the HTML, but Drupal will take care of rendering it into HTML. Once we have just the render array, render array we can return that. And so this will then get put into this wrapper. Okay, I'm going to jump back to the browser so we can see it in action and actually look at the code a little bit. I'm going to refresh the page. I'm going to inspect this element in Firebug so we can kind of take a look at what's happening in the source code here. So the first time this form gets built, we have this empty div right here. 
input OS Verify wrapper. This is right below our select box. You can kind of see the elements being highlighted that I'm hovering over in the main body of the browser. And when go ahead and watch this element when we change the operating system. So you see now it's no longer empty. There's something in it. We can expand it. And if we expand it, we'll see the checkbox input. So Drupal goes back. So, so let's go ahead and go through the steps just real quick. And then I'll uh, see if you guys have questions. I'm sure you do. So the first part is adding our Ajax attribute to an element. When this changes, then this function gets called, which returns a render array that fills in this element. We add this element to the form as some markup. And then when the user changes this input, that gets pulled in and the form gets rebuilt in the back end. OK. Questions about uh, Ajax, the Ajax attribute? Can you go back to the code again? Yes. Any particular part you wanted to see? This is, I guess, this is the, the bulk of it. Right. And that's, that's a good bit of when the form's initially displayed based on whatever the value is, or, but then whenever it's re, the Ajax rebuilds it so it does it again, is that what's happening? Right. So uh, when this form gets built initially, I'm scrolling up to the top here, uh, the, the render array gets passed to two parameters, form and form state. The first time this gets rendered, there's uh, form state doesn't have any values, right? Because the form is just getting rendered. But when the form gets submitted, or we're rebuilding the form with Ajax, then it has some values in it. So the first time this form gets built, there's not going to be any value for the OS, because the OS, if we look at the browser, is it defaults to empty. It defaults to this, right? And so, uh, so there's nothing here, so this code won't get run. But once somebody selects it, then there will be a value here, and we'll go ahead and convert it to a checkbox. How many uh, do, do people feel like they kind of get the, the autocomplete stuff here? Can you go back to the browser? Yeah. <coughs> Not the autocomplete, but the Ajax stuff. So if you wanted to add, uh, basically take away that, um, that wrapper there, or that uh, checkbox, when yeah. they selected not, nothing as it just did, right. would you then add an else to that, that last statement? I'm trying to figure out what happened there. It's set. It's just it's like empty. Like it's say that again. The value is set, but it's empty. So if you were to say is not empty. Oh. <coughs> right. So if like uh, this, or like or the PHP function, not not empty. empty. Yeah. Just if right. Got it. Like so. Let's go ahead and try that. See if that does a trick. Eh. Good call, guys. <laughs> yeah, applause, applause. <laughs> I knew that. <coughs> yes? That's good. Um, yeah, it's pretty different. Um, I've only tried a couple of times with six, <laughs> so uh, so yeah, it is it is kind of a it's different piece. All JavaScript and all, a whole bunch of hairiness. Yeah, it's, it's kind of messy. Like Auto complete is the same, but Ajax Ajax is very different. Okay. Yeah, they've simplified it so much. It's it's a pleasure to use now. Yeah. Uh, these three components. Um, would this be the final, fundamentally the same tools you'd use to do like a multi-step form? Um, or, or is that right? Well, multi-step is a little different. Yeah, I mean, you could probably build a multi-step this way. I mean, and like dynamically show like different parts of the form, like if it's all one page. But if you're going to be like submitting the form and then moving on to the next step, then there's a different process for that. Thanks. Yeah. It would be the same within a single step in a multi-step form. Right. Yeah, yeah, within a single step. And you could, like, use state to, like, hide one section and show in the next section. High right. steps. 
that kind of thing. But then going back and forth, you would need to like kind of trigger like back forth buttons and you know, I mean, it, multi step isn't like trivial, you know, with if you're using just you know vanilla form API stuff. But yeah, yeah. When you manipulate a form that has an AJAX callback in it, does the form alter get called again? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like any time a form is rendered, hook form alter gets called. Is it being rendered though when you, when you select something in that operating system? It is because the 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 form is being rebuilt in the background. Um, you know, you might not see any changes if we're not pulling the HTML to back to the front end, but the cached version of the form may change in the background. That makes sense. You didn't have to write like a menu callback or anything like that, right? For Ajax? Right. Uh, for this one, we we didn't. We just uh, added the callback in the wrapper. So what what is the request? Just yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. We can look at we can look in Firebug and see real quick. So we change that, and it's going to system slash Ajax is the page. So that takes care of the processing. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any uh, performance issues like on? Slow machine, slow servers or slow connection speeds or anything along those lines? Are there with Ajax? Yeah, with Ajax and Drupal and uh, something to look out for, or is it? Well, I mean, what you're doing is loading a page in the background. I, I don't know if it goes through the entire bootstrapping process uh, for Ajax. I think it, it. I think it must. I think it must have to. Um, so there's that happening. You know, you get some additional performance because you're using Ajax and not having to do a full page refresh. But as far as the server load, it's going to be the same as a, as any other page request. So, so like um, building in mechanisms to make sure that like you know like you know ten requests don't go out really fast um, could be very helpful. You know, if you're if you're wondering about that. But yeah, Ajax in, in this case is just the same as any other page load. Yes. Uh, the auto-complete history is saved on the server? Yeah. Um, it's a, well, the, the way we did it here was with a variable get and variable set. And um, that just uses it. Um, what Drupal does is it stores it in a table called variables. And this is, the, yeah, this would have the same history for everybody. So this example, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to put something like this in a variable the variable table, just as a disclaimer, guys. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do something like this, you'd probably want some other table to do it because variable gets the variable table gets loaded on every page load. So you don't, you know, even if you're not using those variables, it gets loaded. So uh, if you were going to like actually build a robust version of this, you'd probably want something else. I think I'm uh, out of time. This ends at 11:15, I think. So um, thank you, everybody, so much. It was really great to, to have you.